But let's get started here. Uh, so today I'm just going to tell you a story. This is basically the outline of my new book called Birding Under the Influence. And I'm going to explain how I went from birds to booze and back again. So I started birding in my backyard at age seven in suburban Philadelphia. Uh, my parents were very indoorsy and had little to no connection to the outdoors. Uh, but they were willing to send me to birding camp. So I attended four 10-day camps over the course of four summers uh, around the U.S. and got to hang out with a whole bunch of other young birders, which was really inspiring. I was also put in touch with ornithologist Robert Ridgely from the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. And his work in South America focused on discovering and conserving birds. And our string of weekend outings together suggested that I could use my, my interest to professional ends. And so by age 15, I had this idea in my head that I was going to be a professional ornithologist, just like my mentor, Robert. That's me at age 12 at birding camp, like full braces and everything there. Uh, but for reasons that I will explain in the next few slides, this ornithological dream kind of got derailed. And that started when I went to prep school. I went to boarding school in Connecticut, and I lived at the school, and so I didn't have access to a car to go birding. And northwestern Connecticut wasn't the most exciting birding place in the world. Plus, I was so busy with school uh, that I kind of di disengaged from birding. Uh, but I did fall in love with kind of biology and science at that time. So then I went to Stanford and did a, a BS in biochemistry and molecular biology. And I liked being in the lab, and I liked doing uh, like reductionist molecular and cellular research. And so the, the organismal and evolutionary side that's kind of more tied to ornithology faded away. But at the end of my time at Stanford, I was pretty set on being a professor at some kind of research institution. So I went and did some pre-doctoral research at Harvard in molecular embryology, specifically studying tissue morphogenesis and patterning in the early embryo. And then the next step in the maturation was a PhD in, uh, at NYU, and I did developmental genetics and molecular cell biology there. Now, this was kind of the primary narrative, but there's a darker side to this in that during this trajectory, I kind of developed a crippling substance abuse problem. And so in high school, I did some infrequent binge drinking only when I was off campus because the rules at the school uh, suggested I'd be thrown out if I did it on campus. But once I got to Stanford and I had unbridled access to alcohol and I started dabbling more with drugs, uh, things got really bad. And so drinking, there was a lot of blacking out. Uh, once I got into the big city and was 21 and started working at nightclubs and DJing, I had this like other hot side of my life that completely replaced birding uh, during these years. And then I specifically chose to go to school at NYU because the program was really good, but it also put me in the biggest party city in the world. And what better way for an alcoholic to get around and not have to drive than take the train? So that was how I ended up at NYU. Um, and it, it's kind of a shame to kind of hand wave this away in a 10 minute talk, but uh, I got sober in my last year of graduate school, and that was a, a really big battle, which is unfortunately only afforded one slide here. That's discussed at length in the book, uh, and it's definitely worth reading. But uh, because I'm an alcoholic addict, I need something to be addicted to at all times. And my birding interest reemerged kind of in that alcoholic and drug vacuum. Um, and the other thing that my addiction, my addictive tendencies redesigned on was uh, my postdoctoral project at Mass General Hospital. So I moved from NYU back to Mass General. So I was very lucky in that school, I could do it even with, uh, with the alcohol stuff going on, going to class drunk and high and whatnot. So, and I started a project specifically looking at synapse remodeling. So how over developmental time do neurons change their pattern of contact with one another and thereby change the information flow through the circuit. And it was super interesting and I was super stoked about this project, but uh, it turned out the deeper I got into this, like over my first two years, there were a lot of technical difficulties. Some of the assays broke down and didn't let me detect subtle phenotypes. Uh, I got a lot of conflicting data that was saying this molecule is implicated or this molecule is not implicated. Uh, my experiments, it was very difficult to, to get to statistical significance because the assays were so sensitive and there was so much noise in the system. And so all of these things contributed to this growing fear of failure. In the absence of alcohol and drugs, I'd articulated this desire. My long-held desire, even while I was drinking, was to be a college professor. And so I'd had one identity crisis when I got sober, and I had to like find a new group of friends and find new hobbies and things. That's where birding came in. But there was also this ego and expectations that I had made this, this intention very public. And that's what I had told people. And so if I am now struggling and rethinking if I want to continue down this career path. What does that mean for me? What does that mean for my identity? What does that mean for my happiness and, and my notion of success moving forward? And so basically I was a hot mess. I felt lost and I, I didn't know what to do with myself. Like, do I restart with another postdoctoral project and push another six years into this? 
and potentially be at the same kind of conflicted point down the line because research is necessarily uncertain. It's called research for a reason. Um, and so as I was kind of having these thoughts, the timing was kind of perfect. This, this is Superstorm Sandy, which swept up the East Coast in November of 2012. So this is right at the end of my second postdoctoral year. And as folks who've been following the news recently might have known, this Hurricane Idalia that came up the East Coast, I don't know, a month or six weeks ago, translocated all of these flamingos, presumably from uh, the Caribbean and Florida, like all over the Northeast. So they've been seeing flamingos in, in Wisconsin and New York and Pennsylvania and Kentucky, where you'd never expect to see a flamingo. So whenever storms come through, uh, they bring with them rare birds from other parts of the world. And Sandy had this huge wind field that reached all the way to Scandinavia, Scandinavia and it captured a couple of these northern lapwings and dragged them across the U.S. and dropped them in Massachusetts. And for reasons I don't have the time to tell you about today, I had to ride a bike to go look for these birds. Usually I would have driven, but on this day, a bicycle was, was how I had to travel. And so I rode out to where these birds were. There's a rather terrible picture of the two of them, but this was like one of the rarest birds I had seen in the U.S. Like they're very common in Europe, but to find them in U.S., was super fun and super different and super cool. So this time on the bike on this afternoon got me thinking, is bike birding a thing? Like, is there any kind of like formalized precedent for this? Uh, are there bike birding trips or clubs? Has anybody else done this before? Or am I sitting on something kind of novel? And most importantly, has anyone done a bicycle big year? Because that would be the coolest project ever. And so what is a big year? Uh, there was a movie made about this a few years ago, and I'll come back to that in a second. But a big year is the ultimate bird finding treasure hunt. And traditionally, they run through the lower 48 states, all of Canada, and all of Alaska, including the westernmost Aleutians. So it's a huge geography that people need to explore uh, during this treasure hunt. It's effectively a scavenger hunt. How many species can you collect in that geography in a calendar year from January 1st to December 31st? And obviously, if you have to cover that much ground, people are going to be using planes, cars, boats, any kind of mode of transportation that gets them to where they need to be to see these birds quickly. And as a result, some of these folks rack up huge travel numbers, like 50,000 miles of driving and 200,000 miles of flight. And when I did this, in two, I did this in 2014, but the idea came to me in 2012, uh, top finishers approached 750 species. And there was a very popular book called The Big Year that was made into this movie, I think, in 2011, if I'm not mistaken. But this movie starred Jack Black, Steve Martin, and Owen Wilson, and actually proved to be quite helpful once I got onto America's Roads, which I'll tell you about in a second here, um, because people had the big year system prime. So even non-birders had seen that movie and there was some context to place what I'm about to tell you that I did into for the average person. So the two problems with the big, existing big year model as I, as I conceived it and, and the problems were, the first is that it's a money grab. He or she who has the most money is going to be able to buy the most plane tickets and fly to the most remote places and see the most species of birds. So there's no real suspense who's going to win. The second problem is that all of this travel is highly consumptive and that's burning up a lot of fossil fuels and contributing to global warming. And while no birder can, no single big year birder can be blamed for global warming, it seems strange to champion the people in the community who have the largest carbon footprints. So I said, could I reinvent the big year using a bicycle? And so I kind of drew this map as a joke before I started of like, this is how I would do this. Uh, the only problem is I had zero cycling experience. And so this was, this was a true adventure in that I was putting my life on the line to take to America's roads with, with <laughs> no knowledge of how it would actually go. But I took the plunge. I left my career, and it was a trajectory that was competitive enough that I wasn't going back after I, I left. And I bought a bike, and I figured out what to do. And so I started in Massachusetts. In the middle of the winter, I needed to find a whole bunch of cold weather specialists uh, before moving south. But that's me on January 1st right there. That's me on January 2nd. It snowed 18 inches. Uh, and when I got back on the roads on the 4th, I couldn't ride on the 2nd or the 3rd because there was too much snow. When I got back on the road on the 4th, it was like 10 degrees below zero. But I found a lot of really cool birds in Massachusetts. In fact, my first bird of the year was Snowy Owl, which was a bird that gave other birders fits in their big year. So that's an amazing start, right? And I'm just going to kind of give you a whirlwind tour of the country. I made it down to Florida. The birds in Florida are great because they're big, slow, uh, tame, and, and approachable, colorful. So like being able to see Rosette Spoonbill and purple gallinule while wearing shorts and a t-shirt was awesome, as opposed to having to wear like 10 layers and be stay puffed the whole time. Uh, I went all the way around the Gulf, 
uh, across western Texas. I rode I-10 all the way from Austin, Texas to the Arizona-New Mexico state line. So 700 miles on the shoulder of the road, 800 miles, starting those rides at 4.35 in the morning to beat the heat, to beat the wind. So it was, it was a true adventure in that sense. Uh, saw some rattlesnakes along the way, so not just birds, but there's the Roadrunner, like iconic of the Southwest. And riding through places like Monument Valley was just absolutely spectacular. It's great in the car, but like I felt so, so much like a pioneer on the bicycle, kind of my frontier spirit was reignited. Uh, Colorado was spectacular. Uh, the Rockies on a bike were unbelievably challenging, but wonderfully rewarding. This bird here was a bird that took me forever to find because of its like seasonally appropriate camouflage. They look like rocks in the summer and in the winter they mate, uh, they molt into pure white garb and they're like invisible against the snow. So seeing ptarmigan was great. Going over 12,000 feet was exhausting. The Pacific Northwest was wonderful. Those are the North Cascades. That's Highway 20. Uh, spruce grouse was another bird I found up there. And then I did the West Coast in September and October. Uh, the Golden Gate Bridge was pretty iconic. That was a really great sense of achievement to reach that after starting in Boston. And then the California coast is, is spectacular. There's a reason that like every car commercial is filmed on, on Highway 1 in Big Sur. And it's like, I just, I felt this overwhelming need to buy a Ford Focus or whatever as I was riding my bike along there. Um, and then I finished the year in Texas. And so I was able to add Whooping Crane, which is kind of the country, the continent's most angelic bird. They're almost five feet tall. I got some kind of Central American species like Aplomato falcon and Ferruginous pygmyow, which just reach into southern, southern Texas. So I wrapped up really well. And this is the map I drew as a joke before I started. And then this is a map of where I actually rode. And you can see that I ended up executing my plan almost to perfection. And I was able to ride further than I anticipated because I underestimated my fitness and underestimated the number of, and, and overestimated the number of days that I need to rest. So when it was all said and done, I thought, I calculated, I thought originally I'd have to ride about 15,000 miles. I rode almost 18,000, walked about 500, and I found 618 species, which I told you earlier, the petroleum powered folks find 750, or at least at the time when I did this. So I found 80 some percent of what they did with a fraction of the resources. I raised almost 50,000 for bird conservation, a lot of flat tires. And the nicest thing about the bike was I could eat whatever I wanted without regret, but I consumed more pizzas than I think is than a person can possibly admit to in a year. And then what emerged from this was like a new identity and purpose. So I went from, from alcoholic scientist to biking bird watcher, and that has grown since I finished this adventure. So when you're not buying cocaine, the money piles up. And so I was able to buy a really nice camera and got involved in bird photography. Uh, I've now written a book, which I'll show you in a second, about this whole trajectory. The book is really good. It's less about birds uh, than it is my search for self and my interaction with people that I met along the way and how those people helped me redefine my notions of success and happiness. Um, I've worked as an ecotourism consultant in developing countries that are trying to attract the American birding market to visit. I now work as a birding guide for this big international company called Tropical Birding. Uh, I'm now apparently a public speaker and I've done some travel writing. So this adventure opened up all these doors. Uh, and so my birding history is my longest personal thread. And it's this like connection to the, the boyish kind of naivete of like wanting to be outside and explore and connection with nature that I've been able to turn into a career and for me, an identity and a purpose. And so I think that this is, this is like what I hope people take away from this is like when you're confused in your life, go back to basics, go back to what makes you happy. And if you do that, then everything else will fall into place, but you just have to trust yourself in that respect. So with that, I'll thank the few people who stick around for retaping. Uh, there's my email, uh, there's my Instagram, the website we're still like building. So if you get a, an error message, don't freak out, just come back in a few days. There's the book. And with that, I'll stop and thank you guys for your attention. Cheers. <laughs> so just a couple of questions. Yes. I think we're gonna, Sit. We're going to sit. We're going to have a little sitting chat here. It's a fireside chat. A little right. fireside chat. All right. So I, I think I listened to one of your, the podcasts that, that you were talking about a little bit of the, the journey to get to the, the, the birding bike uh, tour across the country. And just that moment in time where you were thinking about going from, you know, sobriety and, and um, using birding as a way to get you there. Um, but I'm sure there was something more behind it. And I think you mentioned your girlfriend at the time was pretty pivotal in that, in that decision to yeah. take that journey and, uh, and really helped you. So you want to talk about that? 
Unfortunately, with the limits of a 10 minute talk, I can't go into the all of the personal stuff behind behind the trip. But I, I joke with people and I say my wife has saved my life twice. So not only did she give me the impetus to get sober after I lost her, but when I was having what I call my midlife crisis as a postdoc, she saw how miserable I was and she sat me down and she said, you need to go on this bike trip and you need to do it without me and I'll wait for you while you do it. And so she sent me out into the world on the bike knowing that I might not come back. Um, other big years, you have to worry about depleting your bank account. I had to worry about losing my life. And so it was a, a huge move on my wife's part, uh, especially as I was hit by a car in Florida and almost hit several other times as I moved around the country. But like our relationship is really featured heavily in the book. And I think that she gave me strength when I didn't have it. So it's, it's a pretty important component in my story, which I couldn't touch on. Oh, Got mine. All right. Even better. <laughs> um, you talked a little bit about accessibility and about um, getting into birding um, as uh, it's an inexpensive, I think, and really rewarding thing you can do. And it doesn't feel like it has to be for people that maybe can do the things that you just did or that you mentioned with, you know, traveling across the world in the country. It can be something in your own backyard. It can be something, I think, in even like Central Park. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, birding is, is arguably the most portable hobby on earth. So I got into town yesterday and I keep a list for every single state that I visit, visited. So I actually took the train over to Virginia and did some birding on that side of the river to fluff up my pathetic Virginia list. But there, there are movements now in birding to even to minimize our carbon footprint to do what's called 5MR birding, which is the five mile radius. So the challenge is how many birds can you find within five miles of your house? So you can do it super localized. I mean, Central Park probably has a bird list of 200 270, 280 species. Um, I think that there's parks here in DC that have bird lists of upwards of 220 or 240. So all you really need is a field guide, which doesn't cost a ton of money and having it even just a, a semi-decent pair of binoculars. But once you do that, you can do this anywhere. You can do it in the jungle in South America. When I had a day in Nairobi before my tour, I just took an Uber to a, to a park and walked around and saw 85 species in downtown Nairobi when I was in Kenya this summer. So it really, it really lends itself well to, to portability and accessibility and, and health. Like a lot of my clients are, are kind of retirees and birding gives them the motivation to get outside and walk around and, and get the blood flowing, albeit not at a, a super high impact level, but it touches a lot of bases and, and performs a lot of functions simultaneously in terms of being able to ground you and, and kind of center you with nature. And I think another thing that you and I talked about before coming here was the, the community aspect of birding, which I had no idea about. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. I mean, there's like a whole, a whole like dark web of birding, like the, the grapevine runs so deep. This is, it's so funny because I've never been introduced before at, at a talk because usually when I'm speaking to birders, they're like, oh my God, it's the crazy guy on the bike. So that's, that's how everybody knows me, but uh, it's an amazing community and it's fun because I have now moved around the country. Uh, wherever I go, I can just plug right into the birding community and the birding community is, is really progressive, really open, really tolerant. And so I know no matter where I go in the US or abroad, I can find a community of people who are, who are like-minded, who won't make me want to light my face on fire when we discuss like environmental protection and those kinds of things. So it's, it's a really great community. And when I travel, I stay with birders and we have like, we have like birding specific versions of Facebook and things. So it's really easy to stay connected with other birders. And I have kind of a, a preconceived notion of, of birders that might be, they're a little bit older, more retirees. or Not quite as dashing as debonair as me, mm -hmm. I understand. But I think this is good because you're dispelling some of the myths of there's a one there's one type of person that gets into birding at one time in your life because you did it much earlier in your life. Yeah, and I think the pandemic really changed the demographic because when people were locked out of theaters and shopping malls and arcades and so on and so forth, they were forced into the out of doors. And so I've noticed a trend at birding festivals that have kind of restarted since the pandemic where you do have a lot more 20 and 30 somethings, uh, millennial types at birding festivals. So you're seeing the demographic shift. And I think that being that I work in the industry now, it would be interesting to see if if more active birding tours would be would be something that we could sell. So not only are people are people coming into the into the hobby, but I think that it's creating economic opportunity for those who recognize it and can move beyond the traditional retiree model, which is kind of driving people from place to place and and minimizing impact and minimizing movement. So, but it's great to see young birders. I love, I love working on these, on these pelagic trips on in California and these young and 12, 13 year old birders come out birding on our boats. And it's, it's awesome to see how enthusiastic they are. It reminds me of when I was 12. 
I love that. And I think it's really fun that um, it's something that's a, it's a good anti-screen kind of a pastime because mm -hmm. you can't do both at the same time. Maybe you can, but. You can't. I will say that technology is making birding really cool because we have this app called eBird. So you flip it on when you go outside and it kicks out a list of the birds that you are likely to see in that specific area. Based, it pulls all the checklists from 20, 20 kilometer radius. So it gives you an idea of what you're to see. And then there's a filter so that if you, if you try to eBird emperor penguin from outside here, it trips the filter and say, did you actually see a penguin or you look high on mushrooms or what is going on here? So, uh, but the technology is playing a big part of it in terms of connecting people and allowing people to share their sightings with one another. So if somebody sees something rare, it gets into the grapevine really quick and like all these people rush out to go and see it. That's awesome. Okay. Final question. What is your favorite bird? I, I'm a big pelagic birder. So pelagic birds are birds that spend their entire life at sea, save for the time they spend nesting. So shearwaters, petrels, and my favorite birds, albatrosses. So like an albatross hatches, and then goes to sea for seven years wandering around before it touches land again. And it's amazing that they can navigate the way that they do. And I think there's something really romantic about the notion of just wandering the world's oceans without any touch points, but still knowing exactly where you are because of the Earth's magnetic compass at any given moment. So I'm a huge Albatross fan. Love that. Well, thank you so much, Dorian Anderson, and good luck with everything with your book. Yeah, cheers, guys. Thanks Next. a lot. <laughs>